So just a brief overview of what this presentation is going to consist of then. Uh, oh. Um, it's going to consist of an overview of IWA's parliamentary activities, including a small bit of history to put it into context. And then at the end, we'll have an update on our current parliamentary campaign for calling for support from government for waterway businesses uh, during the current COVID-19 crisis. So, what is pol political lobbying? Um, the National Council for Voluntary Organisations definition is shown here. And basically, charities generally carry out parliamentary lobbying in order to get something changed. But it's also important to raise awareness of your issue or organisation in readiness for future campaigns. And it's worth pointing out uh, early in this presentation that IWA is and always has been completely non-political. We work with whichever party is in power, uh, but otherwise all our campaigning is apolitical. So IWA has a long history. Uh, of campaigning. From the very beginning of IWA's creation, lobbying has been really important. IWA was formed less than two years before a larger part of the waterway system was nationalised through the Transport Act 1947, which created the British Transport Commission. Since then, there have been numerous Acts of Parliament, reports, surveys and inquiries which IWA has campaigned about. This slide just shows some of those over the first 50 years of the association's existence and only shows legislation which affected waterways nationally, as opposed to the many which were related to individual waterways. Behind all those acts, reports and inquiries will have been endless letter writing and meetings, time spent ensuring MPs understood all the issues. This was often backed up by getting them out to visit a waterway. This delightful picture from 1962 shows David Hutchings escorting John Talbot MP on a visit to the Stourbridge Canal. In 1957, a committee of inquiry into the inland waterways resulted in the Bose Report, which saved most of the 771 miles proposed for abandonment, abandonment in the 1955 Act. And there's a lovely quote from Bulletin, the then equivalent of our Waterways magazine, from October 1958, which said, To a degree expected by few, the report of the Bose Committee, though not perfect, represents a triumph for our association and offers an immense new hope for the British inland waterways system. But enough about history. What is IWA doing to lobby about the waterways today? So parliamentary lobbying falls into two, four different areas really. Um, and I'm going to go through each of these four areas in a bit more detail. Contact building um, is basically something that we have to start afresh with every time there's a general election to a greater or greater or lesser extent, depending on whether there's also been a change of government. And we have a new resource available to you, uh, which is a database which lists all the West Westminster parliamentary constituencies which have waterways in them. You can download this from the website and it allows you to check at a glance which constituency any particular waterway is in, the name of the current MP, which restoration projects sit in which constituencies, and likewise with IWA branches. When I first pulled this together for the, uh, after the 2015 election, I didn't envisage that I would have to update it quite so substantially for two more general elections quite so quickly. So as I mentioned, you can sign up to download a copy of this, um, which is a system which enables you to then receive updates whenever we update the database. And it, as a resource, it works particularly well in conjunction with IWA's Waterways Directory which details all 6,500 miles of waterways ever built or made navigable. And both of those links are easily found on the website. So more contact building. Um, since the general election, we've written to all the MPs on that list with our current parliamentary briefing. And before the lockdown, we'd actually had a number of responses from an individual MPs wishing to follow up contacts with local IWA branches and restoration societies and we'll obviously be picking those back up again once uh, restrictions are lifted. For the previous two general elections, we produced waterway manifestos, which we encouraged all candidates for the constituencies in the uh, general election campaign leading up to the election um, to pledge their support for. And this worked really well in establishing relationships with some of the MPs who were subsequently elected, 
but we just didn't have time to do that level of engagement due to the lack of notice for this most recent general election. IWA holds regular parliamentary events, such as receptions and dinners. And many of you may have attended the restoration themed reception that we held last summer. This large scale event was an opportunity to launch the Waterways in Progress grant scheme and was intended by 45 MPs and Lords, as well as 100 or so people representing the restoration sector. Often our parliamentary events are smaller than this though. And in January this year, we held a reception for all the newly elected and re-elected MPs following the general election to introduce them to IWA and the Waterways. At these events, it's often the individual conversations that can make the difference to future campaigns. And this event was no different with some really good quality contacts being made. Presenting an MP or a Lord with a trophy is a really good way of raising the profile of the waterways to parliamentarians. And last year, we also involved IWA branches and restoration societies in the nominating process for our Parliamentarian of the Year Award for the first time. And this slide shows the most recent three recipients. Uh, so we have Andrew Bridgen, uh, Wendy Morton MP and Lord German. Um, so they've been the most three recent recipients of that award. So in terms of policy shaping, IWA does this through meetings with the Waterway Minister and officials at DEFRA, such as people in the Inland Waterways Policy Team. And this photo shows Rebecca Powell, MP for Taunton Dean in Somerset, who's currently Waterway Minister, although this photo was actually taken at a previous meeting of an all-party parliamentary group for the Waterways meeting a couple of years ago when she was actually standing in for the then Waterway Minister. So this slide gives an overview of the type of legislation and different stages that it has to go through. Uh, I'm not going to talk through it in great detail, you can see it all there, um, but just to mention one example of legislation that IWA has been involved with in recent years, and that was the Middle Level Bill, which received royal assent and became an act in November 2018. IWA supported the bill through its various stages uh, and Eastern Region Chairman Chris Howes attended Westminster to give evidence in support of the bill. So within those four broad categories of activity, there were various specific actions and processes. And I'll just go through each of these in a little bit more detail. Select committees. IWA has given evidence to select committees on a number of occasions in recent years. There was one which scrutinised Canal and River Trust soon after it was set up. And more recently, the HS2 Select Committee, where IWA has given evidence a number of times. This photo shows former IWA Navigation Committee Chairman Gwen Mesham giving evidence in 2016. And more recently, Phil Sharp in 2000, July 2018 presented IWA's petition which was asking re for recognition of the residential use of most canal boats and for better noise mitigation. There were various types of parliamentary debate and the process for securing debates are different in each house. And this is where it becomes particularly useful to have cultivated good relationships with individual MPs and peers. The most recent full debate on the inland waterways was a couple of years ago now, when Lord German, shown here, secured a grand committee debate about the future of the UK's inland waterways. Parliamentary questions can be useful. There's two types, oral and written. They can be tabled at any time. Um, each department has a slot for questions to be answered, so they can be used to obtain information, press for action, raise issues or challenge government policy. And we've been particularly successful in getting asking MPs to submit questions on a number of occasions in recent years, uh, particularly in relation to our campaign about funding for the Environment Agency navigations. But we have learned that it's important that the right question is asked, because <clears throat> sometimes the answer can uh, literally answer the question that was asked and not the question you actually wanted to be asked. You can sign up to receive alerts to find out any time waterways or canal or IWA or your particular project or restoration scheme is mentioned by signing up for alerts at either of those two websites mentioned. So the all party parliamentary 
group. APPGs are cross-party and they involve both peers and MPs. There are hundreds of groups on specific areas ranging from topics such as ageing through to zoos. They're not involved in formal decision making, but they're important in developing knowledge. IWA provides the Secretariat, which is currently run through a third party, the all party parliamentary group for the waterways. And recent topics for meetings have included funding for the publicly owned navigation authorities and water re restoration. APPGs have to be reconstituted for each new parliament. We lost 50% of the MP officers including the chairman in the last December's general election. And this photo here shows the new APPG chairman, Michael Fabricant MP, and MP for South Cluid, Simon Baines, after the inaugural meeting for the new parliament held just a few weeks ago. This slide gives a quick overview of some of the activity we've carried out over the last year or two. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that topics for APPGW meetings that were being planned before the current lockdown included one on the topic of waterway restoration, a catalyst for wider generation, and another on getting out on the water, the health, social and economic benefits of boating and recreational sports on our inland waterways. But those, both of those have been put on hold uh, due to the current restrictions. But in the meantime, we have managed to convene a special APPG meetings take place by video in relation to the current campaign that I will come up on to later on. And we don't forget uh, the politicians in the devolved governments. We've written twice in the last 12 months to the Scottish Parliament, responding initially at their request concerning the state of Scotland's waterways. And we took the opportunity to raise a number of concerns, particularly about the lowland canals. And for the last Welsh Assembly elections, we produced a Welsh manifesto bilingual of course and we're currently in the process of adding new sections to the parliamentary directory so that it will include contacts for members of the Scottish Parliament and Welsh Assembly members too. A lot of the work that we carry out is just as relevant to local authorities and at a national level we're having conversations with the local government organisation and last year, it was the end of last year, we exhibited at the annual conference of SOLUS, Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, where we promoted IWA's key messages to chief executives and other senior staff. So in carrying out all this activity, there are a number of useful resources that can be used by all of us. Uh, some recent reports that IWA has published uh, Value of the inland waterways, really, really useful, valuable piece of evidence for uh, demonstrating the value of the waterways. And of course, waterways in progress. And both can be found on the IWA website. Watch out also for a new report on heritage, which is being launched very soon. And don't forget to attend the next webinar, next Tuesday lunchtime webinar, this time next week, where Amy Tilson will be telling you all about that. And another resource that we find really useful in talking to any MP, and I know the same goes to talking about talking to the general public about waterways, um, is a waterways map. It's amazing how it can engage people into conversation. This photo shows Wendy Humphreys, chairman of IWA Lancashire and Cumbria branch, talking to Rosie Winterton MP at our most recent reception. So IWA branch officers and restoration societies and anybody else promoting the waterways can support IWA's message in Parliament by engaging with your MPs at a local level, particularly ahead of events that we might be running at Parliament, but also just out and about in your own constituencies. So find out who your MPs are. Most waterways run through more than one constituency and invite them to events that are happening. Not right now, obviously, but when the... Uh, current lockdown restrictions are lifted um, and even maybe think about taking them out on a boat trip because that could be a really good way of engaging MPs. So this brings us on to our current campaign. There are many ways in which COVID-19 has affected our inland waterways already. No leisure boating allowed, congested towpaths, conflicts between people using it for their daily local exercise and those living on boats. But the most urgent concern that we're campaigning government about right now is the impact on waterway businesses. 
in particular waterway businesses who fall between the gaps of help currently being offered for individuals and businesses. And the contact building and profile raising that IWA has carried out over the last few years, including with new MPs since the general election four months ago, has suddenly proved very useful. So what have we done so far? An early meeting with DEFRA back in March, which had been in the diaries anyway, but took place by video link, gave us an opportunity to provide them with information on the likely impact on navigation authorities, voters and waterway businesses. And then working in partnership with Waterways World, so we were combining their extensive database of waterway contacts uh, with our political lobbying capacity. We launched a survey to help us gather information about what the key issues are. And many thanks to all those waterway businesses and organisations who responded. On the 15th of April, uh, we were joint signatories with British Marine, Broads Authority, Canal and River Trust and ourselves on a letter to DEFRA outlining concerns. And DEFRA responded to that by asking a very specific set of questions relating to waterway businesses. And the findings of a joint IWA Waterways World survey proved invaluable for working on that joint response. Again, in partnership with those other three organisations. And this was submitted to DEFRA just last week. Some of the key issues identified in the survey are that uh, the, there's the potential loss of nearly two thirds of the sector's income. Um, the inland waterways leisure industry is worth approximately 1.5 billion to the UK economy. There's a potential, potential loss of up to 20,000 jobs in the sector. Waterway businesses are disproportionately impacted because the majority, majority do not have land premises that qualify them for, any, for existing government support. And there's a very high dependency on income during the spring and summer months. So COVID-19 has hit at the worst possible time. Annual expenditure has already been paid out in maintenance and running costs over the winter. And 90% of the responding, respondents uh, reported that their waterway businesses normal activities primarily from April to September. Most waterway businesses have had to cease trading completely while the current restrictions are in place with, with a few having closed permanently already and the majority of businesses surveyed are at significant risk of collapse before the end of the year. So this is very serious stuff. 70% of inland waterway businesses have little or no access to grants, loan schemes or rates rebates currently offered by government as most do not occupy rateable premises. So we're asking government to look at two things. Um, a financial package similar to that recently announced for the fishing industry to enable navigation authorities to underwrite license and mooring fees for waterway businesses for this year. That would relieve waterway businesses of significant costs and allow navigation authorities to continue to maintain the waterways so that people can safely use these waterways when the current restrictions are over. And secondly, uh, to expand the current financial schemes on offer to include small waterway businesses without land-based premises so that these businesses, the smaller navigation authorities and also waterway-based charities, some of whom re rely on trading for their income, can access the support that they require. As ever in the world of politics things are constantly changing and we've had some success, possible success, announced just yesterday with this new loan scheme for small businesses. The information that we've provided to DEFRA, along with lobbying carried out by other sectors, we're sure will have helped get to this stage. But equally, we're not entirely sure how useful that new announcement is going to be. So, what can you do to help? We're asking, we're, we're about to write as IWA to all MPs on our database, asking them to raise this issue with DEFRA and HM Treasury. And we would like everybody to write to their own MPs in support of waterway businesses or, water, or waterway charities or other organisations in your local area. Um, later on today, we'll have a bullet point template available on our website. And the main points we want to be, the, the main asks that we want you to ask of your MPs are to, for them to write to DEFRA and HMT. Uh, so it's George Eustace, Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, uh, who are the key points of contact that we want MPs to raise the issue with. 
And also we've managed to secure an APPG meeting on the 14th of May that we'll be inviting all MPs to attend. And it would be great if we can encourage MPs to attend that meeting. So this afternoon, communications will start to go out. And that is the end of my presentation. So if anybody's got any questions, I'm, we're happy to answer them. So going to the first, uh, first question that, uh, that I, I noticed. Um, great question, um, Alison, that's uh, come through from Terry Cavender at the uh, uh, Buckingham uh, Canal uh, Trust. Uh, many restoration societies are also businesses in, and they also <laughs> employ people. Uh, are, are you including these as part of the current campaign? Yes, very much so. So we encouraged uh, um, waterway charities who carry out trading activity to take part in the main survey, the waterway business survey that we ran in partnership with Waterways World week before last. And a number of them did respond to that. But in the meantime, we've also just last week launched a more tailored survey of uh, non-profit and uh, non-profit corporate members um, but that can equally go to anybody who's not a corporate member of IWA um, to try to gather clearer picture about what the issues are not just for those waterway societies who might carry out some trading uh, but also wider impact in terms of fundraising or the impact on individual volunteers and the ability to get practical work up and running again afterwards. Uh, so if you haven't already, uh, do take part in that survey and uh, if you need the link, just uh, send me an email um, and Great. it will also be part of wider communications. Yeah, I think, I think it's important that um, when we've sent the information out to either canal trusts or businesses, we really haven't been too worried about whether people are receiving it twice. I think it's going to be more important if you, if you think there's, there's a canal trust or a waterway business, uh, then it, uh, making sure that that link goes out to them is, is more, more important than worrying about whether they're going to uh, uh, get the email too many times. And um, so uh, another question, just going back uh, to, to things in relation to the APPGs, um, are they open to the public and how do people find out about when they're being held? Oh, the answer to that is no, they're not open to the public. Um, the official line from government is that APPG meetings must never be advertised as public meetings. If an APPG chair meeting is open to non-pass holders, then these individuals must receive personal invitations. So basically it's down to the chair or the officers of each APPG as to who gets invited. And so what we've done in recent well, what the, um, we've encouraged the chair and the APPG to do over the, recent, the most few recent meetings, a couple of years or so, is to hold at least two meetings a year which are open to stakeholders. So those stakeholders have then been chosen based on the topic of the meeting. So the restoration one was open to all restoration societies. Uh, we held another one earlier on that was uh, about funding for the publicly owned waterways. So. Um, more general waterway organisations were involved, invited to that one. Um, so basically, if you're interested in attending, let me know and I will add you to the list uh, that I keep of organisations to be invited, depending on the topic for each meeting. Great, thank you. So um, one of the other uh, questions was, uh, please can we have the slide set to share with others who didn't participate today? Um, and I think we can make that available. Um, as I perhaps should have said right at the beginning, the reason that we were recording this is that uh, like the other waterway webinars that we have run, they will be available on uh, the IWA YouTube channel uh, in, uh, could be up to a week's time, but that's perhaps one of the very best ways of of making it available because then you've not only got the slide set but you've got Alison's wonderful presentation of it as well but of course the slide sets uh, can be uh, available if you want to use those uh, yourself. Any thoughts yourself on that Alison? Yes that's fine I'm more than happy for my set of slides to be used. Yes. Great, great. 
So in terms of a couple of um, campaigning topics, um, is there anything else that can be done in campaigning terms about HS2 development? That must be one of the biggest political uh, areas that we're potentially campaigning on. Yes, so Phil Sharp is doing excellent work coordinating all that and he has put in hours and hours of work um, responding to all the consultations and various documents uh, that have happened over the last few years but also that are going to come up in the future. So yes, we are beavering away behind the scenes continually campaigning to mitigate the impact of HS2 on the waterways. Great. Um, so uh, quite an in-depth uh, question, actually mo slightly more uh, making comments has come through from, uh, from Simon Judge and I just uh, I want to raise that and not to em embarrass you Alison but uh, I think there are a few people would really like to have had the chance to sing happy birthday to you today uh, belatedly for yesterday. <laughs> uh, we won't do that right now but if you want to go and sing happy birthday or send Alison your, your birthday wishes after the, the call I'm sure she'll uh, be very grateful to, to receive those so uh, it's uh, always a bit strange doing a birthday or having a birthday at this uh, particular particular time but um, Simon's um, comments really were based on being a retired civil servant uh, mm -hmm. And he's just mentioned that he would very much agree with your point uh, that in drafting those parliamentary questions, it's really important to uh, work out what you are really questioning on and, and what sort of answer you want. Uh, and so he's saying that it was often very difficult to, to get to the, the point of what someone was actually asking for. Uh, he also said he'd support the focus on lobbying other levels of government. Um, particularly and then as well as those, those devolved uh, governments so also suggesting that we don't forget the elected mayors as well so that's a, mm -hmm. an interesting area um, and I know that Michael Fabricant uh, it has been working very closely um, it, with uh, Andy Street in, in Birmingham uh, and so I think that's a very very good point because our, our cities um, have clearly got a lot of uh, waterways, navigable rivers and canals uh, around them. And um, then, uh, uh, then Simon's third point was, uh, he was interested in the focus on business related to the waterways of all sorts. Um, he's saying that um, this is a much more compelling case that uh, uh, some people that are pushing on about uh, personal and, and uh, uh, private boating licenses uh, might have focused on up to now. What are your thoughts on that? Because clearly that we, we've got to keep, as IWA, we've got to keep things in balance. Uh, and we've focused in on the boating businesses here, but clearly there are issues for uh, private boaters as well. Yes, absolutely. So I think we can um, welcome Canal and River Trust announcement of uh, just in the last few days where they've mm. said they're going to give an extra month to everybody with a voting license. Mm. Um, but I think the problem is if we all started campaigning to have our free licenses for a few months, the navigation authorities wouldn't have the money to carry out the maintenance that they need to be carrying on with in order that the waterways will still be navigable for when mm. all these restrictions are over. So I don't think that that's the right campaign for IWA mm. at this stage. And that's why we're you know, focusing very much on the waterway businesses because they bring so much of the income to the waterways themselves. Yeah I think that's that's an interesting point. There are no entirely right or easy decisions and campaigns in this particular uh, situation. We're making least worst judgments all the way and I think that's one of the, the key things that I'd emphasize. Um, I've often talked about we're campaigning not complaining and I think central to really campaigning effectively is strong consultations and really good research. How do you think we're best placed to, to make sure our campaigns are as well informed as possible Alison? How much more support could you have? How do you think we could drive forward even more effectively than we are already? Well, I think it's very much about getting the input of our members and our supporters. So whenever we put out a specific request for information or ideas, 
or facts and figures, do let us know. And if we haven't particularly asked for something and you think we're missing something, then just write, write to us, let us know, let us know what we're not doing so that we can be looking at it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think working with our partners, you, you raised a point very clearly that Canal and River Trust, British Marine, Broads Authority, uh, recognised how IWA could add to what we're uh, to, could add to what, what they were doing, and we want to work in partnership. Being able to uh, work with Waterways World, who are acknowledged as having that really strong directory, uh, and the the Waterways Annual just gave us so much greater reach. Um, one question around: how, Could we influence? Have any influence on the MEPs uh, in terms of? partnerships projects with long uh, and long established, established valuable EU partners. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's an interesting one. I must admit, even up until the current um, present day, we've not done a lot of engaging with MEPs, uh, except on a very ad hoc or local regional level, I think. I'm not aware that IWA has done much in the past at a national level in engaging with MEPs. Mm. Um, but those people who were MEPs um, will have all those contacts. So yes, mm. it's worth engaging with them. We have yeah. contacts with some, uh, some um, former MEPs. Great, well, if, and if anybody has got good, good connections out into the MEP, former MEP community, then uh, let us know and we're, uh, we're fortunate that uh, we've got Sir Robert Atkins uh, on our trustees and uh, can really extend our reach out into uh, the wider political and the, uh, the MEP world. Um, uh, a question from, uh, from Ivor Kaplan. Uh, looking ahead to when we return to some form of normality, it seems that there might be a good future uh, for waterway businesses as people perhaps are a bit more inclined, or a bit less inclined to holiday abroad. How can we actually support the businesses and promote the benefits of enjoying our, our waterways and supporting our economy? Oh, absolutely. I think once all this, all the restrictions are lifted, there is the potential for the waterway businesses who've provided they've survived the current situation. Um, I think there's a potential for them to get their bookings back up and running fairly quickly. And um, definitely we will be doing all we can to promote waterways generally as we always have done in the past. Uh, if anybody's got any specific ideas about how we can do that, um, we'd be interested in hearing them. But yes, we definitely will be needing to do that, definitely. And I think, um, as you made the point, uh, obviously we've been engaging with DEFRA, but it's not just about DEFRA where the, the issue is here. Um, we've also been engaging, again, as you said, with the local uh, local government uh, minister and uh, we've been recognizing that there's uh, real value in um, engaging with the department for uh, uh, culture media and sport uh, because of the leisure aspects of the waterways and so again it's about as broad uh, a range of political engagement as we uh, possibly uh, possibly have. Um, I'm just going to check out some other questions but please do keep those, those questions coming. Um, so a question or a comment um, uh, in relation to uh, Canal River Trust uh, activities at the moment and very con uh, question from Robert Morland. I'm, I'm very conscious that uh, Canal River Trust publicity is very much in terms of uh, not using the canals and towpaths during this crisis uh, he strongly report, uh, supports that at the moment uh, in the light, light of uh, uh, self-isolation and social distancing. Uh, but should we be looking for opportunities to move later to some relaxation for opportunities around walking on towpaths that are not heavily used and that won't be heavily used? Uh, and so uh, that's uh, Robert, who's obviously a, a regional advisory board uh, member for the, the Canal and River Trust in the Southwest. Any thoughts on that? I think it's going to be a really difficult message because we need to ensure that the people who are living on boats and the people who want to be able to take their daily exercise uh, within waterways that are accessible from their own homes um, 
don't feel that we're promoting the waterways to a wider um, circle of the population too soon. So yes, I think there will get a stage where we will be needing to say the waterways are open again, but we need to be guided by government on that. I don't think we can jump the gun in trying to encourage more people to use the waterways until, until that's government advice, really. Yeah, and it's one of those areas where you, it's so difficult to apply any uh, blanket or generic guidance. Uh, some of our recent activity has stemmed from conversations that I've had with, with Richard Parry, the Canal and River Trust, uh, and trying to look at how we can be as supportive as possible, yet recognising that there are problems in, in particular areas. And we were looking at whether, you, could you just say everywhere within the M25 or within the major uh, conurbations, just, just to say that's just too crowded. And it's not the case. Uh, there are many areas, uh, even around London or perhaps around the Regent's Canal, when the towpaths are wide, uh, there's no boats that are going to be moored there. Whereas if you go down towards the Victoria Park area, where the towpaths are a little narrow, lots of boats around. And if Victoria Park has been closed by the local authority, then it's going to put extra pressure on. So again, it's one of those areas where it's the least worst uh, option that we're trying to define. And actually, we're really dependent on people just being really, really sensible and recognising that we're all in this together. So, yeah, real, real challenge. So, um, again, I'm just looking uh, across the, the, the question and answers on, on my other uh, window here. Um, any last thoughts? I think we've got uh, quite a few questions. Um, so there was a question that came up in the chat window. Um, uh, towpaths were closed uh, by British Waterways in 2001 when we uh, had foot and mouth. Um, does Canal and River Trust have the power to close them now? Um, I, I, that's not a question I can answer. I don't know whether, um, again, that's whether that's one single answer. It may depend differently on, on different areas. So as I recall from the 2001 foot and mouth, um, it wasn't the whole of the waterways, even British waterways, waterways system. Um, it was mostly rural areas where they did close towpaths. Um, yeah. And uh, well, I think the problem with doing that is the people since then, the sheer increase in number of people who are living on boats, um, who will still need to be able to use those waterways at, at those towpaths, mm. and the people who are living really close to the waterways in terms of accessing them so i think yeah. it's a good one it is interesting and of course we're we're in, in iwa we're uh, conscious that whilst we've got a great relationship with canal and river trust and they are uh, the the largest waterway authority there are many other navigation authorities right across the country as well and so it isn't just uh, what canal and river trust decides to do here uh, again and again uh, when uh, a towpath goes through uh, a major city uh, or town then it can often be uh, the local authority that will have some uh, control over that and in many cases uh, towpaths are part of uh, the national footpaths and and again many local uh, bylaws and restrictions in terms of who can and who can't uh, govern uh, those those particular uh, areas um, again I'm just uh, looking at uh, a little bit distracted, sorry, with the, the chat window. I know a number of you are discussing what the canal is that's behind <laughs> me. Uh, so sorry just to go off on a tangent, just to put your minds at rest. Uh, it is the uh, South Oxford Canal uh, between uh, Upper Hayford and Somerton. It's an area close to home, and I'm very thankful that I can go out and use the, uh, the towpaths locally. We're fortunate as we walk down the hill, we can see whether there are any boats moored and if there are, then we can avoid them. So again, I've been able to uh, use uh, the, the towpaths. Again, we're very fortunate in our local area that we've got uh, Victoria Prentice as the, our local MP. Uh, she's also uh, a, a, a environment uh, and DEFRA minister and uh, takes a very strong interest in, in the waterways. And I'd encourage you to uh, pick up on uh, what Alison has said about how we can, each and every one of us, 
can support the campaigning uh, exercise. Campaigning across IWA isn't solely uh, the preserve of Alison and her team or campaigning officers in any one particular branch. It is actually something we can all engage with and that uh, through the diversity of IWA is what really gives us our reach and our relevance. So uh, I'd encourage you to do that uh, and watch out for the, uh, the information that's, uh, that, that, that's coming out. Um, so another question, um, so oh, just a comment actually, uh, just on what I've just been talking about, uh, about toll paths. Uh, some toll paths are designated rights of way, um, others are permissive, uh, and take uh, different regulations to actually close those. So uh, yeah, good good point. Um, emphasizing what I was I was reflecting. Um, so actually, a really interesting question here because again, it comes down to how well informed our campaigning activity is. Obviously, we've focused on businesses. We're focusing in on canal trusts. Um, but is IWA or WERG collecting figures about how many volunteer hours are not able to be used during this crisis uh, and perhaps putting some uh, monetary value on that loss because we can we can actually very clearly uh, create a monetary value for those volunteer hours what, what are your thoughts on that i think that would be really valuable i think for waterway recovery group those hours are very easily um, identified because we know what canal camps and what work regional weekends would have taken place mm. For IWA volunteers, it's much more tricky and we have um, started to try to gather information about volunteer hours in the past, but it's not been entirely successful. Um, hopefully the new IWA website will actually in allow volunteers to let us know what time, what you know, hours you're putting in to supporting the association so that we can put a value on those. No, I think that's uh, I think that's a really good point, and it must admit it wasn't something I particularly thought about. And so, uh, if any of the work party uh, volunteers, uh, branch chairs, uh, branch committee members are here, if there are ways of collating that information and looking back, perhaps through March and April, in terms of what you would have ideally done and you wouldn't be able to do please do feed that in because it will be invaluable because it also has a knock-on effect in terms of us being able to apply for grants uh, because we can uh, where a grant it needs to be match funded the volunteer hours actually does count as valid match funding even though it's not in financial terms many many grant awarding authorities will uh, allow that to be used so uh, let's try and grab that um, because I know that uh, almost all work party activity has stopped uh, across the network. Uh, if, if any of you are actually managing to do some uh, socially distanced work, please do let us know as well, because it will be good to have some of those, those stories. Um, another question in about the Environment Agency. Uh, do you see them as part of government or a navigation authority or both? Uh, or both. Um, it's a bit, a bit confused, uh, perhaps in some people's minds. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so they are the second largest navigation authority for the 630 odd miles that they manage. Um, they weren't included in our letter to DEFRA, um, where we were working jointly with British Marine, Broads Authority and Canal and River Trust. Um, so Canal and River Trust and Broads Authority being the first and third largest navigation mm. authorities. Um, because they're directly funded by DEFRA. Um, so that obviously puts them in a different situation. So in terms of their wider environmental remit, they are obviously part of government. Um, and that's one of the reasons, of course, we've been campaigning for their navigation function to be transferred to Canal and River Trust, because they happen to manage those 600 odd miles of waterway um, just due to the accident of history through how the different government agencies that have ended up in DEFRA. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we believe that <clears throat> those would be better outside of that funding, so funded separately. Um, uh, in so, so in terms of this current campaign, obviously the Environment Agency have got a massive job to do in terms of the overall dealing with the impact of COVID-19. 
Um, so we're noticing that in terms of the navigation teams, they're all busy doing other things and haven't been able to engage with us in the same way that we've been able to engage with, for example, the Broad Authority and Canal and River Trust. Yeah, well, it's, I think it's so important to continue our engagement with all of the uh, navigation authorities and we will continue to do that in a much uh, an even greater uh, collaborative uh, approach going forward. Um, great question uh, here from Andrew Denny, uh, Alison. In your experience, is Parliament getting more or less sympathetic and listening to IWA and Canal and River Trust uh, than it was to British Water, uh, uh, up to the point where British uh, Waterways were set up in, in 2012? Yeah, I think that's a really difficult question to answer. I think it depends what you're comparing it to. So I think probably in the few years leading up directly to 2012 and the creation of Canal and River Trust, then yes, probably. But obviously, if you look back at the longer history of IWA, then that goes back much longer and uh, you know has been really important over the decades. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I've certainly got an opinion on that. And, and uh, although uh, as everyone knows well my my history in iwa is very short but even in the last few years and even uh, since the beginning of this year the fact that defra reached out to us at the beginning of the year uh, to ask for for information and recognize that uh, iwa can because of its independence bring really good independent authoritative analysis of what's going on uh, i think they do recognize that that, that 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 iwa represents a powerful source of information and actually i think certainly in my discussions uh with the uh, other three organizations that we've been involved in uh, involved with recently of course they can make representation into government and should be but uh iwa brings a level of independence that can support their calls for action uh, in a way that where one authority might ask for government plead uh, that plead government for intervention government could come back to them and say well you would say that anyway uh, because uh, you're directly affected and you're trying to protect your own uh, turf if you like whereas iwa can be truly representative of all the voices right across the the waterways ecosystem and i think uh, we should continue to recognize our value in that area uh, whilst working even more closely with these individual organizations as well so i'm i'm really encouraged by uh, government interaction uh, and i'm very much more encouraged by our ability to deliver to government what they uh, what they want um, so I'm conscious of time, we've, we've probably got uh, about five minutes before we, we, we need to wrap things up. And I think there are more questions coming through. And if we don't uh, answer all the questions, we will uh, capture them and, and try and provide uh, answers uh, back to the folks that are asking uh, them. Um, so a question around, um, uh, or a comment around uh, volunteers, uh, ours again, as Simon was saying, the question's an interesting one. Uh, and I'm sure there may be some good practice or tips on how to collect that data. Uh, perhaps NCVO has got uh, views in terms of how other charities are, are picking that up. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just, he was just really reflecting that other charities are wrestling with that. So I think we need to, to look at that. Um, just another observation coming in, um, Buckingham Canal Society uh, did about 1,200 uh, uh, volunteer hours uh, a month last year. Uh, and uh, uh, guessing at March and April is probably losing about 2,000 hours. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, several corporate groups uh, cancelling. And so there's a, there's a lottery value of that of around 12 pounds an hour. So there's uh, 24,000 pounds of lost, a potential lost, uh, lost ramp income. So this is a serious matter. So with that in mind, if anyone uh, out there can start to look at uh, the, these figures, it is a, again, another useful representation back to government and particularly uh, the government areas that are supporting charities and voluntary organizations. Um, 
So, um, Alison, a question that's really close to your heart, um, balsam bashing. Ah. Um, so uh, it's an ideal soci socially isolated activity <clears throat> and the season, the season will soon be upon us. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I guess wow. you'll be encouraging people if there's even the yeah. slightest lifting of, of lockdown to get out there. Yeah. So, um, yes. Um, where are we now? April. So June onwards, June, July, early August um, is obviously at the usual time of year when we're encouraging people to go out and work parties, putting up. Himalayan balsam um, but over the last two or three years we've run this pull snap stomp campaign which is very much about individuals if you're out for a walk along the tape path or anywhere actually um, and you see some Himalayan balsam pull it up snap the root off below the lowest growing node so it can't regrow and put it in the on the verge or the back side of the tape path and stamp on it so pull snap stomp um, and yes, we can be encouraging people to do that. I think even within their, your current um, permitted activity and your daily exercise. So yes, watch out for Himalayan balsam this summer. Great, thank you for that. Well, um, uh, my apologies if I've missed any of the questions on the way through. I think we've managed to uh, it Might just be worth um, mentioning. Uh, so I noticed that Phil Sharp is um, amongst us, amongst yes. the listeners in, and he's responded to the question about HS2. So I'll just read out what he said. Yep. Um, he says he's currently drafting a response to the National Infrastructure Commission's, co Commission's call for evidence on phase 2B and its integration with other rail plans in the North and the Midlands. Any comments will be welcome. Um, so that's from Phil Sharp. So if anybody's got any comments on that, um, let us have them and we can get them to Phil. Great. And, and, and I think this is one of the areas that we need to, as I said before, this, our, our political campaigning and our campaigning activity in general uh, isn't just restricted to the activities of, of the, the staff team in, in Chesham. We know that many branches uh, are very active in this. I know that Phil has been absolutely central to what we've been doing on HS2 and uh, folks like uh, Ray Alexander down in the, the southwest have been very actively campaigning on areas like uh, the Bridgewater Tidal Barrier and so there are a great many activities that happen across the association and we need to make sure that the how we learn uh, and the experiences that we have there how they inform activities elsewhere across the organization because we are one association and we don't need to be starting off at, uh, uh, at the basic foundational level on a lot of these activities we've got great resources available so um uh, Alison there was one just comment about uh, how do people contact you so um should we just uh, post your uh, email address in the uh, chat window is that the best way to do that yes we can do that certainly so, yes um, yes I'm happy. i'll, I'll ask uh, uh, yep. that so keep an eye on that uh, chat window and uh grab allison's email address uh but uh just for those of you that don't have that chat window open it's allison.smedley at waterways.org.uk so allison um I'll, I'll leave the questions there. Any final remarks uh, from you just as we uh, bring the session to a close? No, it's just been great to have so many people taking part and thanks for all your questions. Um, uh, yeah, do, do email me and look out um, for some communications coming out in the next uh, hours and days to do with our current uh, campaign.